विडिकस और शैलवी स्टार्ट So if you are waiting for any more participants to join, maybe I am okay to wait for another five ten minutes. I'm here on the. Okay. Okay. I'll wait. I'll wait for five minutes. Okay. Sure. Vidhi ke sir, how are you? Subaraman madam here. Hello madam, how are you doing? Hello, I am fine. I am fine. How are you? I am doing good, madam. Thanks a lot. Okay. Thanks a lot. Long After time. you gave that uh, training program in COEP, I yes, started yes, teaching yes. analog VLSI in Valchand. Wow. So last, uh, yeah. Your training was really good, and you were supposed to come to DKT also. I think sometime, some months yes. back. Yes, but i think your program really got cancelled perhaps yes. Yes, yes 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 so i'm very happy to again listen to you today oh thank you so much ma'am it's a pleasure to <laughs> talk to you thank thank you thank rathod sir did not give an option to say no <laughs> <laughs> rathod sir is a task master <laughs> <laughs> yes. Madam, ma'am, I am really happy. Finally, I, I after looking in the participants list, sir's name, <laughs> his name. I wanted his name. <laughs> I wanted that he should be listed here, and he sh we 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 have an opportunity to listen to him. <laughs> yes, correct, correct, correct. I mean, you could. Yeah, 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 you could uh, basically do it successfully. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, sir has a challenges, lot of challenges, but finally he has joined. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Kulkarni sir, I think uh, I should start at least your introduction and that part will get over. Sure sir, let's get started. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. So I welcome you all uh, for this second day of STTP. Uh, today we have the session from Entupal. Today and tomorrow, both days we will have the session from Entupal. And we are fortunate to have Venugopal sir with us for kickstarting uh, this session. So Venugopal sir, as such, no need of introduction. You simply call VDK. Everybody knows in the VLSI industry who is VDK. But still, uh, I'll do my job of introducing sir as a uh, formal mechanism. Uh, so Venugopal sir, Venugopal Kulkarni, popularly known as VDK, is an independent consultant and a chief mentor for Entupad Technologies India Private Limited in the area of analog and mixed signal design. He is an expert in analog and mixed signal design with over 32 plus years of cumulative academic and industry experience in the area of electronic system design, analog and mixed signal integrated circuit design and system modeling. He also conducts several technical skill development programs for faculty and engineering personnel in the area of analog and mixed signal circuits and system design. His previous roles include heading the training and development division of Corel Technologies Bangalore as a dean of Sandipani School of Embedded Systems and VLSI Design. Here he worked on training curriculum development, content design and delivery. The programs were aimed at fresh graduate engineers, engineering college faculty and engineering working engineers working in the corporate. He has trained over 3000 plus corporate engineers and fresh graduates in the area of electronic system design and customized design while at Korean Technologies Bangalore. He also worked with Sankalp Semiconductor as a senior lead analog design and was full time faculty at BVB College of Engineering, Hubli. Venugopal Kulkarni obtained his MTech in microelectronics from IIT Bombay and his BE electrical engineering from Karnataka University, Dharwar. Thank you very much, sir, uh, for uh, conducting this particular session. And at the same time, I would also like to take a privilege to introduce our other uh, guest uh, who will be conducting the sessions on behalf of Entupal. So with us, uh, Mr. Sijo Thomas, who is working as an analog and RF design engineer. He has four years of experience in the domain and currently working with Entupal Technologies Private Limited Bangalore. He is experienced analog design specialist with a demonstrated history of working in the electrical and electronic manufacturing industry with experience in 180 nanometer and below. He is skilled in analog circuit design, IC design flow and proficient in cadence PDA tools. Sir has a strong background in CMOS process, network analysis, single stage to multi-stage amplifiers. He completed Master of Technology, MTech, focused in the VLSI design from ESRM Institute of Science and Technology. Chennai. So I welcome Shijo uh, Thomas sir uh, to you and looking forward for your sessions as well. And we also have uh, Mr. Naveen Shankar uh, again from Entupal. He is a postgraduate with specialization in applied electronics from Anna University. He is currently working as an application engineer for Cadence at Entupal Technologies Private Limited Bangalore for over three years. He is responsible for training and technical support on Cadence tools for Pan India customers. Prior to this, he has been an embedded developer for Broadgate Technical Services, Chennai. He was a technical engineer for embedded products at Trident Tech Labs, Chennai. And he was also an assistant professor at Veltech University, Chennai. He has also presented and published many research papers at various national and international conferences and general uh, journals. His overall experience is over five years across the industries and institutions at various capabilities. So, uh, industrial background and his teaching background will definitely have a value-added, uh, enriched experience for us. Uh, so, thank you, uh, Naveen Shankar sir, for joining our SCD program. So, I welcome you all, entire team of Entupal. And now, I hand over the floor to Venugopal sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Rathod sir, uh, for a nice introduction of uh, the team and myself. Uh, on behalf of uh, Entrepreneur Technologies uh, and my team of Sijo and uh, Nagin Shankar, 
I thank you uh, very much uh, for the opportunity given uh, to interact with uh, House of Professors up here, which I'm sure are certainly much more knowledgeable than perhaps I am. Uh, let's just share my learning, whatever it is right now. Right, so let me go ahead and share my uh, content. Sijo uh, <coughs> uh, actually will be primarily assisting uh, me and also running some sessions on the design illustrations uh, for the circuits for both schematic design as well as the way of design and Navin actually will be supporting primarily. In addition, Navin also will bring out uh, one session exclusively on the custom IC design flow for uh, digital gate functions that will be tomorrow. Right, so. <coughs> Is my screen visible to all? Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah, clear. Audio, video, everything is clear, sir. All right, sir. Thank you. Yeah, just at the outset, I would like to set an expectation. I am sitting in a smaller city, sound like uh, Hubli, and here the uh, network can go bad without notice. So please bear with that. Not in my hands. All right. So uh, I, I hope at least for the session, uh, the network stays good. Right, so going forward, uh, for the AICT sponsored SPP on VLSI design using Cadence Flow, right? uh, today and tomorrow we'll be talking about an introduction to analog IC design. And uh, for day one, that is today, uh, my team and I actually will attempt to develop a little bit of illustrations and a little bit of a quick touch on the background right, on analog circuit design and setting the course structure. Let me get started by out the agenda. So we have three sessions today, and in session one, now uh, I actually build up uh, the perspective for analog circuit design. And in session two, more of the tool flow, but through this illustration, I actually end up building the transconductance efficiency design methodology for analog circuits, uh, along with uh, CEO who actually will help me to run the things actually on the tool. Right? And then in session three, we extend that methodology to do a schematic capture full flesh for a given set of specifications for a complete seven pack operational amplifier. That's a two stage architecture. Right, so that is day one session. And tomorrow actually we'll be talking about the layout, which primarily will be handled by Sijo. Yeah, as uh, Rathod sir already uh, uh, perhaps actually mentioned, I have a little bit of a difficult situation personal front. So I have kind of, you know, uh, requested Rathod sir to allow me to kind of, you know, uh, be available for roughly about Two sessions, the first two sessions. Post that, if I'm required by team, will actually give me a call and depending on my dynamics on my side, I'll attempt my best to be back here, supporting the team as well as the interactions. All right. So going forward, setting the perspective for analog integrated circuit design. The session agenda for the first session, I'll be looking at uh, setting the perspective and evolving amplifier circuit topology. So what actually I do is because there is a lot of derivations, a lot of equations, a lot of theory already published enough in well-known textbooks by very good authors and also lots and lots of papers, both refereed journals from IEEE and other such comparable ones and apart from other conference journals. I'll be basically focusing on building the thought process than getting into the integrities of things, right? So these derivations, these equations, etc., are indeed available. However, I'll just attempt to stitch things down, right? As quickly as possible so that we spend more time on illustrative design activities than simply talking some theory, right? So where uh, you feel necessary, please feel free to uh, raise a query actually on the chat. I request that the queries be raised on the chat and that actually address each one of them to the best extent possible. Right. Then actually we look at the mass amplifier design and challenges. So the objective here I'm trying to address is to attempt build a bridge between what we learn or teach in the classrooms in academic campuses and what we do in the industry. <coughs> right. So let me actually start with what? Well, let me start by asking a question. Right. And uh, please feel free to uh, kind of you know express your uh, answers, responses on the chat. Uh, Rathod sir, if you could just uh, enable the chat to be visible, uh, that would be great. Sir, it is enabled for you. It is visible. Yes, sir. Yes sir. yes, sir. So I'll not be immediately picking the questions, although I'll be seeing the chat, right? Uh, mostly uh, Navin actually will help me to kind of you know, interrupt, or Arthur himself also can actually interrupt me 
because if I give my attention to chat, then I may lose the flow. Right? So uh, I'll actually address the questions raised in the chat right? uh, post this session. All right. So the, my question actually is, what is the single most important objective of teaching or learning ECE curriculum? For ECE, my definition actually is electrical communication engineering. I'm being a little selfish up here because my basic degree actually is electrical, not ECE. All right. This will take a so what's the most important objective of teaching, learning, first year to final year, maybe on the master's program? The reason actually why I'm raising this question actually is because as a student, I always had this question, why do I need to learn or study this particular subject? Yes, and it was not easy for me to start relating why do I need to study or learn a subject? The bottom line, actually, I find out, find out over the years, out of my learnings, is that, well, no subject is a subject that I can say I don't need to learn. Right? So here's my answer uh, for that. Right? That is, there's some problem with the network. All right. The single most important objective, in my view, is communication engineering. And what really is communication engineering? All right. At the outset, I generally attempt to avoid getting down to the technical jargons uh, and keep it simple layman's language so that I can make sense. So a simple way of looking at or defining communication engineering is that it is an efficient representation, transaction, and retrieval of information. So the engineering or the techniques or the methodologies that actually we adopt or we develop for efficient representation, transaction, and retrieval of information. We'll not actually get down to what is information, how is it represented, all of us perhaps are aware, but let me just quickly look at certain of these things. So how do I define or measure efficiency? have primarily three parameters, which are performance, power, and area. First and foremost, actually, is how fast can be the information transaction from one point in space to another point in space, right? And how much power is required to transact the information, because we all have learned in school that to move anything from one point in space to another, right, we need to spend energy, right? Third, actually, is how compact is the information? So whether to talk about information or the vehicles or the engines, that facilitate information, acquisition, processing, transaction, retrieval, and reconstruction. That is basically electronics, right? And maybe RF also. So if you look at this, focusing on electronics, right? Bottom line actually is, we look back to kids or recollect our childhood and realize that anything that is small in size eats less and runs faster. And that's the primary motivation for advanced nodes, shrinking down to five nanometers and below going forward. We already are at five nanometers. So that's what I should call it as EPA, performance, power, and area. Right? Looking at the application perspective, why is this so important? Why is this so critical? And how is it all related to the electronic system design people system? What is the actual application perspective? And one of the very important and applications which is attracting lots of interest across the globe right is the automotive electronics right so we live in a connected world and which actually comprises of electronic systems as well as software application protocol interfaces which actually are an integral part of this particular connected world it's all we talk about IoT, we talk about cloud, we talk about data management, we talk about AI, we talk about machine learning, deep learning, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So what we find it is that all this actually is built on electronics that facilitates to run lots of software on it, right? So what we find is that we have more electronics in the car than the car itself that moves. Right, so setting the 
signal perspective, right? So here actually I have some pictures which we typically learn in signals in systems. So the information that we talk about is represented by means of a set of signals, which typically are functions of both time as well as space. And our focus actually is only on those signals which are functions of time alone and independent of space. So we are focusing on a localized region of space. Right. So what actually we have is that information in general is a continuous time signal. Right. And therefore, to acquire it, we typically have to multiply it by an impulse train essentially equivalent to setting up ordinates at desired time instance. Right. Uh, then resulting in a set of ordinates which we call samples, discretized samples, and using these, we convert that to a discontinuous time signal, which typically we call digital. Right. And what I can find here, right, is that depending on my sampling withdrawal, right, I actually can bump into sampling errors. And because we do not know how to precisely measure, define or measure anything, right, we actually get into quantization error. So discretization on the time axis results in sampling error and discretization in space, right, this, uh, results in quantization error. So just to make sense uh, about quantization error, I actually have a small example. I have a measuring jar with only two markings, zero millimeters and 200 milliliters, and it is partially filled, as the picture shows, uh, with water or milk or whatever you want. Right. So now the question is, from measurements perspective, right, uh, is the glass full or empty? If you can express your answer of the chat, that is interesting for me to learn. Right. My question is repeated here. From measurements perspective, given the glass jar with only two measuring marks and partially filled with some liquid, right, uh, is the glass empty or full? Purely from measurements perspective. Right. Now, coming to the system's perspective, right, what actually we find is that we are talking about building a system for information processing. So we can talk about looking at this particular picture, right, a system that directly handles signals in the real world, which are invariably analog in nature, right, and then facilitates conversions to the digital domain. Right, or it could as well be a system that works in the digital domain and handles basically in terms of binary numbers. Right, so to look at a system as a simple black box, one input or more than one input, one output, one output, where the relationship between y and x is arbitrary but is known to us. So because it is arbitrary but known to us, the best way to represent the relationship between y and x is by drawing the graph as is shown here, which we call the global transfer characteristics of this black box system. <coughs> yes, I actually get to see an uh, answer here to my question. The glass or measuring jar is full, right? So how do we know that? I have a question here because the level of the liquid is not coinciding with the measurement mark of the element here, so I can't qualify it as full. And to fully answer your, my question, right? Can I qualify it is empty? The answer is yes, because the liquid has certainly touched and or crossed the zero ml mark. So I round it down to zero ml from measurement perspective. Therefore, your measurements perspective, right? The glass is empty, and so much of the error is the quantization error. I'm rounding it down. If it were very close to 200 ml and actually maybe I would actually rounded it up to 200 ml, but it is somewhere in between. Okay, I hope I answered the question. So now, how do I make a system function as a digital system under static conditions? Or static conditions, I just need to make a system either exit at one end or one extreme of the global transfer characteristics or the other extreme under static conditions. That means when input and output signals are not changing with respect to time, at least over certain finite durations of time. So finite time. Right, so when I make system exist under static conditions at one of the two extreme ends of the characteristics, 
then the system functions as a digital system. One of these extremes I can use to represent logic zero and other logic one. Please note that the logic zero reference for input and output need not be the same. They can be different. And that's the reason why we actually call C uh, whenever we talk about chip design and get a physical design kit or a library from a foundry, we actually find that we have uh, entities available in the library which are called for core design and we also have for IO design. So the core design and the IO design, the logic one levels actually are different. And in some cases, logic zero levels also can be different if there is an isolation provided. Right. So next question actually is, how do I make the system function as an analog system? To answer this, we first of all require to ask one more preliminary question. What is the fundamental property or a characteristics that must be exhibited by this system for it to function as an analog system? Let me take a live with that. Right. So right now, I'm speaking to the microphone, all right, and that actually is getting communicated, and you're actually giving me. Right, so let us say, like, you know, you visualize a classroom in which the professor or lecturer actually is lecturing, right, and the air medium there actually is uniform, right, the fans are not running fast, so there is no worrying of fans, right, so air flow is very, very uniform, so whatever the professor speaks typically will reach everybody and will be able to hear the true voice of the professor. This is so because Right, even here also in my case, as I'm speaking to the microphone, you'll be able to hear that, right? Subject to, of course, network speeds, right? Uh, very clearly, that is so because as I pump air from my lungs through my larynx, the sound box, and oral cavity and speak up words, right? Uh, 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 the, the air actually is vibrating, and this sound energy is getting to the mic again between between the mic and mouth, the air is uniform, so it's a linear system. And therefore, depending on the modulation of my voice, both frequency as well as volume, accordingly, you get to hear that very proportionate. This is only because the system, entire system is linear, right between my mouth and the microphone I'm speaking with. That's all the reason is. So what really is linear? It must primarily follow two principles, satisfy two principles. One is scalability, meaning if I increase the force with which I pump air out of my lungs, I'll illustrate that. I'll say hello twice. Hello. Hello. So you can actually see that as I increase the force with which I pump air out of my lungs while saying hello the second time, you found that because of the linear medium interfacing, the sound output from my mouth and the microphone and whatever actually lies between the speakers that actually are hearing my sound in from, right? Uh, assuming all this to be linear, you find that if I multiply the input signal by a factor k, the output response also is scaled by the k. That's what actually is scalability, also called homogeneity. That's one property uh, system which is linear must satisfy. The second actually is Additivity or superposition. Let me illustrate that live again. What actually I will do is I'll say hello once, then tap my desk, right? One at a time. I'm saying hello now. Hello. So it's perhaps actually here two different things. Now, what actually I will do is I'll do both together. Hello. So you can actually hear the additive effect of both my desk tapping as well as me speaking hello. So that is actually is superposition. So any system that satisfies scalability or homogeneity and superposition, that is additivity, right, is said to be linear. And we require linearity as a fundamental property for any system for it to function as a analog system. However, whatever system the human kind actually has built turns out to be typically non-linear in nature, as shown by the global transfer characteristics curve. So how do I linearize it? Very simple. Break the curve down into a number of very small segments where the size of the segment actually is measured in terms of x2 minus x1, which is actually shown for one of the segments. Right? So in the limit if x2 minus x1, x2 minus x1 
tends to zero and the segment is small enough and therefore we can ignore the curvature of the graph and replace it by a straight line approximation. If we now force this black box to sit on this particular chosen segment and operate only between its extreme boundaries, then we will have forced the system to work as a linear system despite being non-linear. And this is exactly what we call the small signal operation, which theoretically we define as limit of x2 minus x1 centered at q, the operating point, where we first of all make the system exist at the mid-ordinate value of this segment, right? Essentially tending to zero, which is the definition. The practical implication actually is that if xq is the passing input value to make the system sit at point q, the mid-ordinate value, then x2 minus x1, right? Uh, must be extremely small compared to XQ. That exactly is what we call the small signal operator. All right, so coming to the world around us, it's all analog. What you hear is analog. What we see is analog. And what we feel and our emotions are all analog. All right. The typical signal chain. So that's analog actually is a beautiful world. Fine. And somehow, uh, even after roughly about now 35 plus years, my uh, if I sent to uh, Rathor sir, actually is about three or four years old one, now the 35 plus year, almost due for retirement, may perhaps those strong after official retirement also following the steps of uh, Tala Subramanian Madam. Madam, I appreciate you a lot. Right. So uh, the typical signal chain for analog signal processing, I have one example from the cell phone audio signal chain. I have the microphone and I have a pre-amplifier which actually amplifies and then amplifies the signals to uh, amplitude levels which are suitable for measurement by EVP and conversion. Then actually happens the signal processing back into analog conversion, some filtering and uh, drive amplifier to drive the loudspeaker. That's a typical signal chain, right, for the audio signal chain on a cell phone, right? And here actually I have a simple picture from Texas Instruments indicating Typical block diagram of a signal chain for analog signal processing from real world. And please note that microphone essentially is a transducer which converts a non electrical sound energy into a proportionate electrical signal in the form of either a voltage or a current. Most of such transducers are designed to produce a voltage out that is basically for the ease of measurement. And therefore, at their output boundary, when I look back into the microphone, right, I can replace this or represent this by its 7 inch equivalent, right, with a 7 inch voltage source, right, uh, which produces a voltage proportional to the input sound energy, right, in series with a 7 inch source resistance. And please note that although it is a 7 inch representation, this particular source of EMF is a signal voltage source and not an energy voltage source. And how do I differentiate between the two? A signal voltage source typically has a source resistance which is large compared to an energy voltage source. So the examples, right, if you compare the microphone output resistance at its output port, it typically turns out to be of the order of at least six not tens of kilo ohms, right? Whereas if you look at the cell phone battery cell that powers your cell phone, its internal resistance is of the order of 0.1 ohms or less. Right? That's what actually the difference between, right, the two voltage sources, both non-ideal. One is the energy source, that is battery. The other is the signal source, for example, a microphone, right? So uh, many times I actually find that uh, a student perhaps will miss out on these subtleties um, understanding the voltage and current sources and differentiating between or distinguishing between the energy source and a signal source right so going forward right? so what really is amplification <coughs> basically multiply the signal available from a sensor or a transducer like microphone, right, by a factor k to essentially scale the power of the signal. 
what is allowed actually is a uh, time delay because we do not know how to make something pass from one boundary to a system and exit at the output boundary of that particular system microphone for example right in zero time and in the process because of the time delay there could be a phase shift in the signal i measure at the output boundary of the signal chain as compared to uh, the signal at the input boundary the necessary condition of course is generated that i already spoke about for faithful reproduction application well, the earliest acoustic amplifiers are shown in picture up there, but what we would like to build actually is the fire that handles electrical signals. So I need an ideation. So how do I think about it? Think simple, because all these ideas which are novel and are great are essentially novel because novelty is in simplicity. So people thought very simple. So just think Ohm's law. So what I have, Ohm's law has two forms. The correct form actually is I is equal to G into V the current in a resistor is directly proportional to the potential difference across it and g is one by resistance why whereas v is equal to r into i is the most widely known application form of ohm's law right so what does it mean i can tweak this so i need a entity a black box which actually produces an output current i out proportional to the input stimulus voltage vs and therefore must have a proportionality constant which has the same dimensions as g we call this gm please note that although i started with ohm's law reference ohm's law talks about conductance or resistance for same point meaning the potential difference and the current are defined at the same pair of terminals whereas what i'm talking about up here are defined at two different pairs of terminals this is defined at the output boundary this is defined at the input boundary that basically means i require a voltage control current source linear one then i also require right uh, current controlled voltage source i to be converted so all that actually i do is simple if if i have to talk about amplification all that i need to do actually is that convert a signal voltage into a proportionate output current of this expression and then pass that current right through a simple resistance which actually can work as a current to voltage converter measure of the voltage across that particular resistance so if the product of gm and rl turns out to be large larger than unity i achieve my amplification of the phase it's as simple as this right so that's the reason why you get to see in textbooks that an amplifier is basically made up of a voltage to current converter followed by a current to voltage converter capital. How do we achieve these things? First of all, we talk about formulating or conceptualizing the device. So here is a simple way of looking at it. I connect two resistors in parallel, <coughs> in series, as shown in the diagram up here. R and R, as the notation goes, the big R is very large compared to the small R guy here, and I pass the same current to them. Series connections is the same current. So what I find actually is that V2 across big R is large compared to V1 across small R. So if I now let I change about a constant value as a function of time, as some arbitrary function of time, then the change in V2 is going to be much large compared to the change in V1, right? So if I take the ratio of V2 to V1, I straight away end up getting amplification in voltage. The only problem with this actually is now, how do I actually make this current proportional to the input voltage V1 and where do I apply this? So that actually brings up the challenge here because if I just put a junction here and pull out a wire, a simple pair of passive resistors that is connected like this cannot function as amplifier. Right? Uh, uh, people who are having a question as to why are requested to spend some time to actually analyze this. Okay, and those who perhaps actually have studied electronics or learned electronics from uh, great authors, nowadays actually many of us actually talk to them actually as old textbooks, their classics. Uh, the author I'm talking about actually is Jacob Milman. Perhaps it will find answer to my question up there. So we implement a similar concept up here in the end as a device. We have several options. Olden days we talked about realizing this by means of a vacuum tube triode, where we used a cathode heated it up, emitted a large number of electrons in the vacuum, right, enclosed inside this glass enclosure, right, and they actually hover between the 
control grid and the cathode. So that's a vacuum space filled with a large density of electrons. Therefore, that's referred to a small resistance. Then we have an anode up here. We connect a positive field up there to attract a few select electrons escaping this wire mesh called control grid, right? And getting directly clear. So this part actually is a large resistance. Same time that is flowing. So if I change this particular voltage V grid as a function of time, right? Then I actually end up finding that uh, I actually get to see uh, last change in V2 across this large resistance. A similar approach, solid state, right? People started working on figuring out a solid state device that works exactly like this and accidentally bumped into a deviation or distraction in the research and came up with what we learned actually as the bipolar transistor, right? Uh, under William Buckley, but you know, return together. Right, and that actually is a simple representation of two PN junctions connected back to back. What actually have shown is an NPN structure. Uh, please note this particular model has drawbacks we called Ebers Mole model. Right, so what actually we do here is uh, we want small resistance, so we end up followed by asking the emitter based junction. We want large resistance, we reverse by asking the collector based junction. Keep ID tending to zero, extremely small. So, under this bias conditions called forward active mole, IC is almost equal to IE, the same condition. Therefore, I get small resistance here, large resistance here, same concept really works. In all these cases, please note that I cannot tap the large voltage across this for external usage. And that is the reason we actually end up connecting an external large resistance in series with the collector here, in series with the anode or the plate here. And that's the same thing that we do also for MOSFETs. All right, so getting down to MOSFETs up there. So what I require essentially is, well, I require, first of all, a voltage control current source that converts the input stimulus voltage into a current. Must be a linear two-port network where output current is inversely proportional to, is directly proportional to Vix up there, as it is shown here, fine. Right, and then uh, Vix is defined as the input control voltage. So GM actually is the short circuit transconductance, right, defined as change in IO or divided by change in Vix when the output is not changing, right? Right, so the voltage control current source, ideal one, the ideal characteristics, the relationship between Vix and I0. It's called the transconductance characteristics. So the slope of is the transconductance, right? And then because I also have an output port voltage, it is good to relate these two because the definition says that I naught should be proportional only to V I X. That means it is, must be independent of V naught, right? So how do I build such a device up here? So that's the output static characteristics. So how do you do, build such a device up here? Pretty simple. So what we do here is that, first of all, recognize that I want the output current. So current is made up of mobile chargers, which I move at the desired time rate along the desired path or across the desired path section. That's how I make up a current. So to make up an output port current, I first of all need to collect mobile charge carriers as a function of an input voltage EIS. And this set of mobile charge carriers must be of known amount but I know how much is Q and of the known type, positive or negative. So I need Q proportional to V and then set Q into motion along the desired path. So because I need to collect charges as a function of voltage, that basically means I need a capacitor, which is what actually I have here. I have a simple capacitor, connect an electric field across the upper and bottom plates, collect negative charges up here, which are the mobile electrons at the surface of the lower electrode. Then, if I now apply a tangential electric field to the surface, as shown by this particular battery connection, right? What I find is that I can set up a current along the surface of the lower electrode. So what is this? Wow, this looks very simple. I just need a capacitor. Unfortunately, right? Does this really work if both the plates of the capacitor happen to be metals? The answer is no. So what people did actually is to go to physicists, idea is good. And this idea actually was first formulated and patented by Lillenfield in 1928. So he patented the MOSFET 
1928, and the first MOSFET was fabricated successfully sometime in mid, right, close to almost half a century. Right. So what physicists did actually is to lower electrode by a p-type semiconductor block as long as the charges we want as p charges to make up current ID are electrons at the surface, and that's our hypothetical MOSFET. Right. I'm not getting into MOS. Yet. So a MOSFET, right, can actually work in different regions of operations. What's a MOSFET? It's a capacitor, nothing else. Right, in which I set up two potential fields, make up a current, which actually can, and, and make a device work as a voltage controlled current source. So different regions of operations, as are listed here as a summary up there, right. So I actually can make the MOSFET work in cutoff, and there's a small leakage current for VGS less than VT, right? So I can actually use it as an electrically open switch, off switch, right? Or I, I can make it work in the linear region and make it sit at the origin. The switch is electrically on, but the current through it is zero, therefore voltage drop across it also is zero. So that actually is device operating in linear region for which VGS has to be greater than the total potential, right? Then actually, as, as I increase the uh, drain potential for a G1 gate to source potential difference equal to or about the third potential, what I actually end up finding is that the device moves out of cutoff, actually into saturation, right, and then enters linear region. So here are the conditions where actually have shown uh, the terminal potential relationships, right, uh, for device to operate in cutoff, linear at the origin linear than at the pinch off, that's the boundary between saturation and the region, right, and the saturation, where uh, the gain to source potential is greater than VGS minus VT. VGS minus VT is the figure of merit technical use for long channel devices. It has a drawback there because uh, with the technology advancing to smaller versions of MOSFETs, the long channel theory no more holds good, but still gives us an extremely insightful information to understand the device this technology knows. Right. Those are the equations, most equations up there with a MOSFET 3D picture as well. Right. So the MOSFET in saturation can actually work as a non-ideal voltage control current source. That is to the right of this particular vertical line or to the right of this particular curve, which is marked as the boundary for VGS equal to VGS minus PT for long channel devices, right? We find that I get a set of statistics curves that almost resemble this set of statistics curves. And therefore, if I make the MOSFET work only in its saturation region, then the model can be used as a voltage controlled current source, albeit a non-ideal one, and therefore can be used for the purpose of amplification, right? Now coming to, well, we got to the MOSFET, and now we have to start figuring out how do I hook up the amplifier circuits? It is simple. For a saturated MOSFET, ID is a function of VGS and VDS. Please note that for advanced nodes, especially with the short channel effects, when we talk about saturation, right, or the pinch of voltage, unlike for the long channel devices for which VGS would be equal to VGS minus VT, for short channel devices, the current saturation actually occurs at a voltage less than this particular voltage because of velocity saturation. Right, so in our further discussions, because we'll be primarily working, uh, looking at uh, designs involving 180 nanometers, although people say the old technology, trust me, we use 180 nanometers primarily for all automotive electronic products. Right, fine. We also use uh, uh, higher dimensions, older technologies, wherever actually they require high precision, high performance, right, uh, circuits, all the way up to. 700 micron technology, right? So I have actually worked on a couple of these technologies. So what actually we're going to illustrate here for, is for 180 nanometers. So although pretty mature technology, 
right? It still does not obey the long channel device equations, right? So then, nonetheless, right? What we find is that the long channel device theory gives us a great insight and intuitive understanding of what exactly is happening with circuit. All right, that's the reason why we basically keep looking at it, and then modify the application the way we use it for practical designs at advanced nodes. So for saturated MOSFET, we have ID as a function of EGS and VGS, and therefore I can write it like this, right? And then for small signal operation, the condition actually is the change in ID, the bias, or the signal drain current, or the change in the drain current, right? Uh, for a given change in V2 source voltage must be made extremely small, ideally make it 10 to zero. If I set the left-hand side equal to zero, recognizing that delta VDS by delta VGS for the device is nothing but the voltage gain, right? I actually can get the voltage gain for the device as a real world entity, right? It is capable of giving us the best available voltage gain, hence called the intrinsic voltage gain, which will be GM times R0, where GM is the device's small signal transconductance and R0 is the small signal drain to source resistance. So the question actually is how to set delta ID by delta VG equal to zero? Just set up the bias gain current using the constant ideal current source, and that's exactly how I get this particular circuit architecture. I set up the gain current as IDQ. So please note that if I'm holding this gain current constant, right, then change in V in, increase in V in must result in a decrease in gain to source potential for the long channel equation to hold good. Let me just go back to that equation up here. In calculation. Is that fine? I'm looking, looking at this. All right, so I'm keeping this constant in that, in that particular source that I showed. All right, so rest all is constant. I'm actually increasing VGS, say, as a signal, right, then because rest all actually is constant for the left hand side to be. This term is increasing, therefore, VGS must decrease. That's what I mean. And you get change in drink to source potential. Right, that apart, you can replace the device by its small signal DC model and write the expression for the voltage gain, which simply turns out to be equal to minus GM times R0 mark here P as R out. All right, so now what I find is that this particular thing, I don't know, we don't have available in the real world. It's an ideal current source. I don't get this. Secondly, R out is internal to the device, so I, it is not possible to tap out this voltage outside for the outside the device for external usage, and that's the reason why we mimic this outside the device by connecting a large resistance RD right in series with the drain, so that the same current flows up here, right, and that's what actually gives us the gain as negative of GM times R out. Please note that as V in moves towards highest potential, V out moves towards lowest potential. There's a phase inversion as represented by this particular design. Right? However, one problem with the two loads that perhaps actually we have done with BGT amplifiers and laboratory sources in detail, right, is that if I need large gains for a given GM means I require large passive resistances. And for a given bias current, I may end up requiring therefore large values of supply voltages which are not available for Integrated circuits. The supply voltages are continuously falling down to below 0.9 volts down. Right? That's pretty simple because on a chip, we are putting in lot many circuits, lot many transistors, right? Therefore, if you look at the whole chip and the entire electronics up there as a lump equivalent resistance, then the power dissipated by the chip is V squared by R, where R is the lump equivalent resistance of the entire circuit of the chip. Right, and therefore, it actually makes sense to keep really as small as possible, practically, right, in order to minimize the power dissipation, right? So that's critically important. And just for the uh, uh, sake of the participant, right, I'd like to just share with you uh, something out of my bag, out of my particular experience. And I was working out on my chip uh, as a master student from IIT Mumbai, and I actually happened to be amongst the first two. IITNs, lucky opportunity though, uh, in India to have brought out a chip to the market in India. 
to be a Bangalore. And the best part actually was that my MTech thesis five hours got over in 30 seconds. That was the best game, I would say, apart from the learning outcomes. All right? Uh, because just when I began my uh, thesis defense, we got a message or phone call from the DEL telling my professors, uh, Jay Vashi and Dinesh Kumar Sharma, sir, at IIT Mumbai, that the chip is true and will be released to the market. And that was a great deal. So my wife was got in 30 seconds before I could read out the title slide. That was the best thing. Right. So, uh, what actually uh, I would like to say here is that when I was at EL, uh, one of the engineers up there actually happened to resign a television chip. And it was actually put up for testing, mounting on a, a test setup with a television. Right. So, we turned it on. I also was assisting to set up those things because it was interesting. Right. Uh, we turned it on, it ran fantastically while TV was running, DD in those days, only blue version, nothing else was there. I'm talking about 1991. Then, after 20 minutes, poof, the television goes off. Then we let it cool down and start again after about half an hour. It again exactly works for 20 minutes and then goes off again. Poof. It started actually confusing us what exactly is happening. What actually the problem was that post lunch, Somebody put a table fan, AC was not working, so some, some problem, right? So they, somebody put a table fan just behind that particular test TV, right? And when you turn the TV on, after 20 minutes, it kept working. We turned the fan off, we found that next 20 minutes, it goes off again. Then we figured out what was the problem. The fan was heating up beyond a certain temperature, and there was a thermal shutdown protection circuit on the chip. So that was working fantastically. So we kept on joking, right, as a tag, right, you buy BLTV, table fan free. Right, so that's what actually I talk about the participation. All right, the next one, we, we happen to correct the design and get the whole thing out working perfectly fine. Right, so just to share my experience about participation. A lot of things actually can go wrong in real life, despite your best efforts. Right, so uh, we generally don't design circuits or amplifiers on IC with passive resistances, but for some exceptions. Especially on those ex exceptions is beyond the scope of this particular section, right? Then we also have then, how do I realize large gains without actually having to use large passive resistances and dissipating a lot of power and requiring a lot of large values of EDD? Very simple, recognize that a MOSFET in saturation essentially works as a non-ideal current source and therefore exhibits a large output port resistance. So why not I exploit this, right? So that's exactly what motivates us to cook up the next circuit. I replaced the passive resistance in the previous slide by a MOSFET. Now comes the question, <coughs> do I use an N MOSFET or a T MOSFET? If I use an N MOSFET, that is just visualize copying and pasting the same MOSFET up here as the load, the result actually is that whenever V out actually is rising towards VD, if I kept the bias potential for the NMOS gate, with this M2 being the NMOS device, there are chances that I might actually turn off the device, right? So that's the reason why we prefer to keep the bias VTFs independent of the signal output node voltage, and therefore we're going for a PMOS device biased in saturation, supplying the brain current working as a non-ideal current source for the active device M1. Right, and that's again expression. These expressions are available there. These are available in the Right, so all this looks good, but then actually we have a problem. The problem actually is that, well, all these circuits that we discussed, right, essentially are measuring the input signal as well as the output signal with respect to a node in the circuit which is at a fixed potential, typically defined as ground or reference node. Right? What actually we find is that if there is a present, that is unwanted signal present at the input, right, then this particular amplifying device right, would amplify not only the signal of interest, but also the noise present along with it and throw out right, the noisy signal out. Just to visualize this, I'm not too sure this current generation actually have had an opportunity to experience this. Uh, but I'm very sure uh, the senior people up there in the team, Professor Rathod, Shaila Madam, myself, there must be a lot of other seniors also, right? We have experienced this while listening to the radio receiving set. 
what we find is that we have the transistor radio receiving set, we have a rectifier or a battery eliminator that we have plugged into the supply lines, right? And what I find is that I, apart from what I want to hear, there also is a power supply hum out of the speaker. It goes like this. Fine. So that's the noise. To give a more realistic experience of noise, analogy of noise, you visualize, well, these are not good times, although the world is slowly opening up, also shutting down once again, right? Thanks to the COVID scenario. But just visualize normal times and over a weekend hitting a mall. There are a lot of people around, so everybody is speaking, right? So when you actually want to speak to somebody standing beside you or on your cell phone calling somebody, you find that there is a lot of background noise. And what do you try to do? You try to just move around wherever you're standing, right? In a radius of about five feet. What do you find? The audio noise level goes down? The answer is no. And the, at the receiving end, the uh, person whom you are speaking to on the cell phone would not only hear your voice, but also the noise background behind. And many times, less of your voice and more of the noise from the background. So can we eliminate or reject the environmental noise that actually is coming from outside world? And that exactly is what actually we talk about next. So all that actually we do is we represent the signal coming as this. So if I split that into two identical but opposite in polarity, and then subtract one from the other. And if I assume now that this is the signal of interest Vs by two, superimposed with a noise V asterisk. Please note that as long as we focus on a localized digital space and keep these two halves of the circuits identical to each other, right, and in close physical proximity. We are exploiting one property of noise, that is its average power spectral density remains more or less constant in a small localized region of space. So the noise signal that rides on this, as well as on this signal, will be identical. So if I subtract this signal from this signal, the noise gets eliminated. And this is exactly what we call the differential signaling as against a single signal I need to amplify. All that I need to do is to convert that into a, into, I mean, split that into two parts, Vs by two, one half with one polarity, other half opposite to it, otherwise exactly identical, right? And then each of these halves essentially are From the measurement perspective, V out, which is difference between the two halves of the signal. So noise present in each half is eliminated. And that exactly is the principle behind differential. Please note, in differential signaling, we are not doing measurements of potentials, right, at any node with respect to another node which is at a fixed potential. This node is not at a fixed potential. Please note. So how do I build this? Very simple. And Kulkarni sir, you are not audible. Hello? Uh, sir, let me check with him, sir. I'll check with him.
uh, sir he'll be back sir uh, he's facing some network issues issues he'll be back yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, sir you are not audible sir vidike sir you are not audible sir and your screen is also not visible Am I audible now? Yes, sir. Uh, you are audible now, sir. Yeah, thank you. I think there was a network issue. Sorry for the inconvenience. I'll share my content again. Is my visible now? Yes, sir. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Right. Talking about the. differential signaling so we can actually realize this particular circuit right by uh, replacing each of these repetitive circuits by a single added common source amplifier to identical copies of it however in this particular circuit we find that the biasing drain current both in m1 and m2 also depend on what's the dc level of the input v in one and v in two which is not desirable right and therefore to make drain currents independent of the input common mode levels, right? We anyway recognize that these two nodes can be joined together. We connect to the tail a uh, constant current source, ISS. So once we actually do this, right, ID in M1 and M2 becomes independent of the input common mode levels. Uh, these actually are simply waveforms which I copy pasted from a textbook, right? The explanation is pretty simple up there. So depending on right v in one minus v in two if it is large positive towards vdd right then actually we find uh, end up finding that right then m1 actually goes into practically linear region right and m2 m2 goes into cutoff right and that exactly is what actually you get to see here for large positive values of v in one minus v in two m2 turns off whereas m1 is fully on conducting the entire current iss through it if however v in one minus v in two goes towards ground right and it's the other way around and therefore you get this set of current characteristics right and the corresponding uh, drain potentials or output voltages are actually shown here and when v in one minus v in two is zero right that's the differential input voltage is zero we find that the output differential voltage or the drain potentials are at vdd minus rd by iss by two each each half of the circuit carrying exactly one half the drain current so that's a, a simple principle of a differential amplifier that we actually evolve step by step right with logical reasoning and using fundamentals of network analysis nothing more than that right so uh, we actually can model a particular network by attempting to replace these passive resistances rd1 equal to rd2 right by p mosfets and then recognize that well uh, many times we might actually require a single ended output just to give an example right uh, 741 is an op amp which actually uh, produces a single ended output voltage v out right measured with respect to a common reference node and is proportional to the differential input voltage which is the difference between the voltages measured at its inverting input terminal and non-inverting input terminals both measured with respect to the same common node, ground or the reference node 
right? So that's a single ended output at a differential input. Whereas what actually is shown here is a differential in, differential out, a differential amplifier with passive resistive loads for each MOSFET, right? So using the same reasoning as we did for the common source amplifier and modified that to a PMOS active current source load, we could perhaps replace each of these resistances by a PMOS device biased in saturation to provide the necessary uh, bias drain current for M1 and M2 and still take out uh, outputs, a measure of outputs at each drain node as a differential voltage out. So please note that if I want to convert such a circuit into a single ended output, then one simple option actually is drop using one of the output nodes, but then the gains falls by half. So what we need to do is to copy the signal current change as a function of V in one of M1 into the drain of M2. And that exactly is what we do circuit by exploiting the fact that, again, I'm referring to the way we use Ohm's law. Ohm's law says I is a function of V for a resistance. Right, and the probability constant actually is G. So if I is a function of V, then V must be the inverse function of I. So if I take a resistance of known value, right, pass a known current, right, and if I keep that current stiff, constant, then I can keep the voltage across that resistance also stiffly constant. So essentially, I can actually make use of a simple resistance hypothetically, right, as a reference battery source by passing a stiffly constant current through it, ignoring, of course, temperature effects, right? And that exactly is what we do here. We connect a MOSFET in the form of diode by shorting its drain and gate terminals. So I actually get a diode forward characteristics. Therefore, this particular MOSFET produces a gate to source voltage proportional to both the quiescent as well as signal currents of M1, right? And then produces the corresponding VGS. And that VGS is applied to M4. And therefore, M4 produces a current ID4, which is equal to that of M3, which in turn is equal to that of M1. And using KCL, we are actually adding algebraically the currents of M1 and M2 at the output node. So as a result, right, what actually end up finding is that I can convert the circuit from a differential in, differential out to a differential in, single ended out, right? That's the conventional way of doing it. Of course, uh, over the time, as the signal amplitudes actually have shrunk down, we prefer to go in for a differential in and differential out signaling all along, including on the printed circuit boards, except for uh, very large power signals on the printed circuit boards, right? So uh, that's the approach we adopt. Right, so uh, we have evolved a differential in single ended out differential amplifier, and by the differential signaling at the input, we are now actually able to reject environmental noise at the input. We are not talking about the noise generated by the devices because of thermal agitations. Right, that again is beyond the scope of the discussion up here. That's a pretty deep topic. Right, so now uh, coming to the op amp circuit topology, it's pretty simple. A two-stage simple op-amp architecture may, is, is made up of two amplifiers cascaded to one another. The input stage is the differential amplifier with a current mirror load that we saw in the previous slide. The output of which is now connected as input to a simple common source amplifier in which the PMOS device actually is used as an amplifying device and the NMOS device M6 uh, one connection is missing in my a couple of connections are missing. It's implicit, right? So uh, M6, which actually is uh, working as a active current source load, right? So what actually we find is that because I am using NMOS differential pair up here, I have a common source amplifier in terms of PMOS active device. If I had used a PMOS differential pair, then actually I would be using this device as the active device and this device as the current source load on it. And that's the typical architecture schematic diagram we actually get, right, for a two-stage operational amplifier. Please note that the output of the first stage is directly coupled to the input of the second stage up here, right? Because on 
integrated circuits not just the effort to build coupling networks in terms of capacitors right or even transformers which is inductive coupling simply because these turn out to be huge in sizes there are exceptions as far as constructing transformers are concerned this we do for voltage isolations for large power applications we do build transformers on silicon using metal wires that are supported on the technology right so that's the complete evolution of the schematic architectures right all the way from the basic hypothetical gain stage with only the mosfet as a real world device rest of the things in the circuit are ideal all the way up to a realistic all mosfet operational amplifier two stage architecture up here right so what we next actually do is to quick start looking at right the amplifier design flow and i'll just basically list up right uh, before we uh, conclude the session right uh, on what exactly we do and what's the conventional way of doing it where we bump into challenges only that i'll bring out and then just set the thought process for the next session where we will illustrate more on the tool while i speak and cjo actually will be helping me uh, in illustrating things actually on the tool rather than only talk about theory because theory is available in lot of published papers right so typical mos amplifier design flow no matter whether it's a simple common source amplifier common gate common drain any combinations right uh, and or maybe more complex amplifiers like two stage or three stage op amp architectures right so what are the typical specifications first and foremost technology no in this case we are going to talk about 180 nanometers technology and here also we actually are going to use a generic non production version of 180 nanometers technology uh, pdk files right supplied by uh, cadence design systems right uh, along with the cadence design flow uh, for customized designs right please note while this this gpdk as it is known is extremely good for learning we cannot actually make a working chip out of it there are non production versions of pdks physical design kits right so one is technology known right then constraints such as there could be a limit on the supply voltage the power dissipation then allowed area for the layout etc etc then of course the circuit performance specifications such as what's the large signal open loop gain also the small signal dc gain which is of more importance to us large signal gain right open loop gain then both the 3 db bandwidth as well as the gain bandwidth for a given capacitive load right then uh, maybe input output which swings plus the slew rate under large signal conditions right how fast i can make the output node rise and fall in potential between two large potential values right then settling time because typically the op amp turns out to be in the simplest form in its simplest form a second order system if i give a step input as input to it right uh, in under differential signal conditions right how does it actually respond so typically will be a second order system response right so those of you perhaps uh, have already been working either in control systems or analog circuit designs uh, discrete or IC level immaterial, right? Perhaps we'll be able to relate to what I, I'm talking talking about as settling time, the second order system for a step response, better than maybe noises, right? And for the noises amongst the participants, I would recommend to go back and brush up your linear control theory, right? Then the startup time. So once I turn the power on, by when the circuit actually would be ready for usage operation? Every circuit actually has a non-zero startup time, right? Uh, because all the parasitic capacitances in the circuit right need to get charged up to their static values voltages and voltages basically right then the noise performance right so uh, how much is the noise generated by the devices in the circuit and how much of that actually appears at the output refer to, I mean, referred basically measured by referring it to the input called input referred noise again beyond the scope of this discussion up here and maybe input output impedances especially for in particular rf circuits because rf circuits i actually uh, tap the signal from the antenna let's say on a cell phone and then the next thing actually i have is a low noise amplifier so i need to do a matching otherwise i lose a signal there signal strength there right so those kinds of specifications in fact if you look at uh, one of the nice books by bezaz razavi on uh, mos analog circuit design you actually find the author talking about an analog design octagon 
So it's an octagon with the vertices, each of the vertices representing the performance parameters of an analog amplifier. So you try to optimize one vertice, then you're actually disturbing seven others. So a design is not necessarily very logical. And therefore, we talk about it as an art. So typically, what actually I have found is, in my experience, that uh, in the industry, the number of analog circuit designers required is extremely small. And if you look at the industry, at least in India, right, the Indian industry is very, very shy of uh, picking analog design engineers, but from premier campuses. There are exceptions, but in general, that has been the trend. And even in the premier campuses, the uh, percentage of people picked purely for analog circuit design is as low as 3% or less. Uh, Shaila, madam, do you agree with me? Right? Uh, whereas a large number of them actually get into yes, either layouts. Yes. Yeah. Yes, I so, do agree. And that is why students are not inclined to take this as a lecture. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Though, because though, it, I cannot, though it is very interesting, though it is very interesting. Yes, because like you know, to be in analog circuit design uh, domain, uh, I guess one needs to be equally comfortable uh, uh, in several subjects, starting from the applied engineering yes. mathematics, right? Yes. And LC, uh, LC, physics, LC circuits, physics, LC circuits, yes. And then electrical networks, analysis, yes, devices, correct. and then yes. linear, at least linear control theory, if not non-linear and discrete control systems. <laughs> right, okay. as well as your signals and systems, DSP, yes. yes, you name it, you have it. And yes. all these typically are treated actually as graded subjects. Yes, correct. So that's, that's, correct. that's the problem. But then, well, uh, as far as circuit designs are concerned, the space available is very small and the field is extremely, extremely niche and narrow. Right. However, when it actually comes to systems, it's the same concepts that actually are required also at the systems level. And please note that going forward globally, <clears throat> there is going to be a huge demand for system level designers, right, uh, than for IC designers in the analog domain, analog and mixed systems, right? Okay. So it basically like you know that's where it's heading to. Right. right? So uh, coming back to the uh, discussion up here. So the design flow typically uh, goes into four steps, where given the performance specifications and constraints, we first derive the design variables from the circuit performance specifications. Some of these right, may also turn out to be device parameters that actually decide the design variables, or they themselves might appear actually as design variables. If not, we actually have to derive the device parameters right uh, related to design variables right uh, from the performance specifications just to give an example the voltage gain for a common source amplifier right is specified let us say as some number 10 it is given by transconductance multiplied by the load resistance fine right? so if the load resistance actually is also put up in terms of the small signal drain to source resistance of a pmos device the common source amplifier <coughs> i need to figure out how can i control gm as well as rl for the active device and the load respectively in this particular circuit by properly biasing and deciding on the channel w by l dimensions of both the mosfets so that I get the desired gain. This exactly is what I mean by from the given circuit performance specifications. For example, the gain of 10, right? I need to arrive at the variables. That is, GM times RL is my design equation up there relating to the gain. And But then, GM turns out to be the device parameter of interest for the active device, whereas RL is the small signal output resistance of the load device, which is PMOS and accordingly size the MOSFETs and also compute the BIOS requirements. This exactly is what we do in step number one. In step two, having done the basic back of the envelope paper and pencil designs, which we always do, although we are keeping, we keep working on laptops or desktops or servers, in the end, we do make use of paper and pencil. That's what works. If I can't feel the circuit and the device, perhaps I cannot hope to be a circuit designer, whether it is analog, digital, IC level, 
or system level doesn't really matter. I need to feel the circuit. Only then I can be a good designer. So step two actually is capture the schematic on a circuit simulation platform and carry out an analog simulation for functional verification, both evaluating the small signal DC, large signal DC, as well as small signal AC response, maybe also transient responses, if they also are specified, such as settling time specifications. Then large signal specifications such as slew rate, which essentially are transient analysis. Step three, having verified and signed off at the schematic level, right? we need to convert this into a physical design, uh, defining the transistors and the connectivity between them right? Uh, on a layout design environment for the given technology node, uh, utilizing the specified uh, material layers of silicon and metals and other things. Right? So having done so, right, uh, we complete the layout engineering. So before we do that, we need to really know where is the input coming from, where exactly is the in output going, and how are the routing to be done between various transistors. Right? So we do floor and routing plan. Although the size of the circuit for any analog circuit or a mixed circuit is far, far, far small compared to what digital physical design engineers do, where they plan the floor and plan the routing and carry out placement and routing, including clock tree synthesis, et cetera, et cetera, right? For uh, digital or mixed signal systems on a chip, right? With, in terms of gate counts, multi-million gates, right? Looks tough there. Well, that actually is more logically and tool intensive, whereas when it actually comes to analog, <coughs> it is highly concept intensive. So having done layout engineering, right, and carried out the layout, we then actually check for design rule compliance as well as layout versus schematic compliance, right? Are we satisfying the design rules specified by the technology vendor? <coughs> Once that also is done, please note that every material layer actually establishes resistances as bulk resistances which are unwanted, so additional components creep into the circuit apart from what we get to see in the schematic because of physical properties, electrical properties of various material layers, right? So resistances, capacitances, inductances, etc., are to be estimated depending on whether it is an analog circuit or it's an RF circuit. If it's RF, I do inductances. Else, generally, I don't, right? So we do this parasitic RC extraction typically, right? And then annotate it back or connect these parasitic resistances and capacitances to the respective nodes wherever they are applicable in my schematic netlist. That's what actually is called back annotation. So now I have a realistic circuit <coughs> on my, right, yet to be in real world. But if my models are correct, my extractions are more realistic, closer to the real world, then by carrying out a post layout simulation, for again functional and performance verification, right? I actually can assure myself that the probability of success when I fabricate this circuit on silicon is likely to be above 95%. Having said so, please note that lots of things actually can go wrong. And typically we find that we have to go through two shuttle runs, that is two fabrication runs for any analog circuit in general, even today although there are a pretty large number of designs that are successful in the first tape out itself. So typically what is practiced in the industry or design houses is that for a given set of specifications, <coughs> there are typically more, at least three different designs done for the same set of specifications and all three actually are tapered out. And then once the chips are back, we test all the three circuits and pick up the ones that fit best. And that's how the designs actually happen. So what we what we don't get to hear in the classrooms actually is this part of the, this dirty part of the story. Okay, so that's the hard secret I'm letting out. Letting out. Right? Well, looks pretty simple, right? However, there are challenges. What actually happens is that the textbook approach, you actually get to see some textbooks. <coughs> Sorry giving you design steps. Uh, one example I can give you actually is uh, Philip Allen and Hallberg, or nowadays it's only Philip Allen, the later editions. 
very good book fundamentally use design approaches right but then does not work for advanced nodes even 180 nanometers technology node result difficulty or pain points faced by professors teaching these subjects in the classrooms we teach from these text textbooks and then we go to the lab <coughs> we give an example does it work so who is wrong either the tool is wrong the student is wrong or i don't believe in the theory taught by the professor or the professor is wrong well nothing is wrong the problem actually is how do we adapt the approach that's what is wrong so the square law of equations of long channel devices do not work for advanced node even for 180 nanometers at best they work good for 350 nanometers and above and not below that right that is so because mosfets are getting more and more complicated as we move towards advanced nodes all the way down to fin fats 7 nanometers 5 nanometers and down the current voltage relationship in saturation depends actually on the inversion level of the channel so when the device actually is in saturation that is operating in saturation region as a relatively constant current device <coughs> at its drain <coughs> the relationship between drain current and the input voltage also depends on what's the level of inversion it can be weak moderate and strong if it is weak inversion that means we already know perhaps the definitions of what is strong inversion <coughs> strong inversion refers to <coughs> that value of the gate potential for which the carrier concentration in the channel equals the majority carrier concentration in the bulk that's what we actually call the strong inversion right so in weak and or moderate inversion the carrier concentration inside the channel right is smaller than right that corresponding to strong inversion and therefore visualizing very simple analogy scenario right early mornings or late nights you can drive your cars pretty fast on the roads right which during daytime typically are found to be having very high traffic density and you hence you cannot drive faster so that basically means that because the carrier concentration is low <coughs> in weak and moderate inversion region <coughs> the channel carriers actually can run faster for a given drain to source voltage field electrical field than in strong inversion so as a result the current here actually is mostly due to diffusion in addition <coughs> in weak inversion and moderate inversion part of the source reach gets followed by asked that's p n junction between the source and the bulk as a result there's a diffusion current injected into the channel yes whereas in strong inversion the current in the channel is mostly drift current <coughs> and the square law is based on an ideal drift current assumption <coughs> and therefore it doesn't really hold good for modern day devices so they're complex devices right in addition short channel effects are not accurately modeled for hand calculations right bottom line no full model for the real world device for hand calculations suitable for paper and pencil designs then how do we strike a balance all right and this is exactly what we discuss in session number two i guess i was supposed to extend the session by some time but also i guess that's okay for you the participants i over started by almost 30 percent sir sessions are completely yours your decision okay. Right. <laughs> you, you decide sir you decide we are enjoying your session i'm enjoying okay. your session that's it <laughs> okay i i hope so i i want to continuously hear i want to continuously hear i don't know about participants uh, one of them one of them can turn on the mic and something if they want to say <laughs> certain certainly yes like you know i actually attempted to quickly collectively cover things right uh mm -hmm. to start like you know you know setting things live on the tool which helps from people going forward today Right, uh, for the want of time, I hope uh, 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 my attempt to make some sense has worked. If not, please feel free to give different feedback. I'm open. <coughs> so, no question answers. No yeah, question no. answers. There are question <laughs> answers. I'm having that slide up here. I'm, I'm coming questions. Follow.
Uh, can I ask one question, sir? Yes, yes, please. Uh, please announce your name. Uh, Subaraman, uh, Shaila Subaraman. Uh, hello, madam. Yes, tell me. Uh, yes. Sir, uh, you may use 180 nanometer or 90 nanometer technology node as such, but for the mm -hmm. analog device to have the uh, RO high or mm -hmm. no change in the current with length, I mean to eliminate mm -hmm. or slightly reduce the channel length parameter, you take mm -hmm. L generally much, much more than the technology node. Yes. I mean, maybe it is 2 micron for uh, maybe 0 0.25, uh, 250 nanometer, it could be 2 micron also. So in that yes. case, though the technology node goes to uh, short channel devices, which is okay for uh, digital circuits, isn't it mm -hmm. again the square law because it is a long channel only now, two micron, there will not be the short channel effects. And then the same equation that is square law and all that will not be applicable. Uh, not exactly, not yeah. exactly. Actually, uh -huh. going back, going by technology uh, uh, jargon, right? Mm. Honestly speaking, a long channel device is one in which the channel length is more than four micron. Achha, okay. So anything below one micron, right? Uh -huh. <coughs> Slowly starts falling into the short channel uh, category mm. of devices. Fine. Mm. And even though you actually use a larger value of length, <coughs> mm. the reasoning you gave is very correct to keep the small signal drain to source resistance as large as possible. Yeah. Because in the end, we are going to use these devices typically in saturation region to right. make them, uh, them actually work as constant current sources between their drain and source terminals. Yes. So one measure, critical measure of how good is the current source behavior at the mm. drain by a MOSFET is mm. to measure the output resistance. And that yes. exactly is where we are trying to only hike up mm. small signal output resistance. This does not necessarily eliminate all the short channel effects. Okay. Okay. Because, like you know, the very way of looking at short channel actually is as I increase the drain potential for a given uh, gate to source potential. Yeah. What fraction of the metallurgical channel length is lost because of pinching? A delta L. Delta L by L. Yeah, where delta L, L by L. The, where L yeah. is the metallurgical uh, channel length. Yeah. And delta L actually is the electrical channel length. Yeah, yeah. Yes. So for long channel devices, this ratio is pretty small. Mm. Yes, correct. And in addition, in addition, as you keep increasing the drain to source potential difference, delta L keeps increasing proportional to electric field. Yeah, but in any case, we are not going to go above maybe three volts for uh, depending upon VDD max for that particular technology. So that is correct. That is correct. Yeah. But then, if you look at any given L, right, it is the electric field in the depletion region that replaces the channel. Yes. Between the drain and the pinched end of the channel, right? So VDS by L. VDS by delta field. L. VDS by delta L. Okay. Is yeah, the delta, electric... delta L is the uh, 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 reduction in the channel length. Yes, yes, I got it. But uh, the electric field will not be uh, VDS by delta L. The electric field in the channel will be delta L by L. No doubt it will go on increasing as you approach towards the drain. No, that's correct. But what actually mm -hmm. also happens is in long channel devices, this electric field remains relatively mm -hmm. constant between the pinched end of the channel and the drain. Okay. Okay. So okay. As a result, the drift current remains constant. Yes. The current is largely drift. Yes. Yes. Whereas if you start falling below one micron mm. channel length, mm. this mm -hmm. statement does not necessarily hold good because yeah, there, is... there also happens to be mobility degradation. Yes. <coughs> so because of this, I cannot actually assume now anymore correctly that mm -hmm. the drain current is mainly drift. Mm. Because mobility mm. is getting degraded. Mm. Mm. Because mm. the drift current actually holds good if mu is constant, independent but, of E. But the derivation of current equation one ID in saturation is by considering both the drift and diffusion components of the current, no sir? That is basically like that's a, that's a approximate modeling for diffusion current. Uh, for the long channel devices, I'm actually mm. basically addressing only drift co component of the current at the drain. Uh, 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 uh. 
Only okay. when you look for short channel, I actually add up in week inversion. I am actually getting the diffusion current. Okay. okay. And that's the reason the model is not very accurate for paper and pencil calculation. Mm, mm, mm. And with the technology moving to advanced nodes, the way mm. the tools report the operating point parameters, right? Small signal that's values also uh, has changed. Uh -huh. I should sell mu into C ox. Then I mm. require W by L. Now, please note that as I shrink the channel dimensions, mm. threshold potential also is a function of both W as well as L. And it's Correct. not a simple relationship. Yes. So almost everything starts changing in a MOSFET mm. as I start mm. shrinking mm. the device dimensions. And therefore, it becomes a complicated device to understand. So what I work out on paper and pencil generally does not work for these nodes on the tools. Mm. So I need to find a bridge between what we understand as the intuitive understanding of the MOSFET from the long term uh, theory. Uh, and how do I marry that to a practical approach for designing my circuits that work? But the equation which is given in the result, which depends upon VD set and VDS, VGS. And again, yes. lambda. Isn't that okay? Yes. Uh -huh. It is not okay. That's what I'm trying to tell. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Okay. okay. So, all we, while we do paper and pencil and uh, 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 designs in industry, mm -hmm. what mm -hmm. we basically end up doing actually is first characterize the devices. Mm. So it is M generate a lot of data okay. and look at the curves or the lookup tables. Okay. So empirical, empirical derivations of the equations then. Not empirical. We actually characterize. Characterize. Okay. We okay. actually characterize those devices from the PDKs. I'll come to that as we go okay. forward. We're going to okay. Okay. That okay, sir. okay, sir. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, yes, yes. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Any other questions? No. Madam, uh, can I add you something, sir? Yeah, yeah, sure, please. Yeah, yeah. Madam, uh, what sir is saying is uh, correct. Those equations are not valid. There are many uh, other uh, new equations are evolved. Considering yeah. all uh, uh, like mobility scattering at the interface, yes, yes, because yes. all all G, our Le GC Le model, these are GC. Level, level one, level two, level three. Yes, yes. So all uh, GC approximation, which our Kang mm -hmm. and Razavi, they had given. Mm -hmm. you no, know, at the starting itself, they have mentioned that yes, they have yes. considered the uniform uh, mm -hmm. uh, mobility distribution, uniform mm -hmm. concentration, mm -hmm. etc. All of no, them. So all things are invalid now. No, my, and, I I agree to that. Only when yeah. you have channel length corresponding to the technology node, if you have 0.24 yes, yes. micron, then these yes. uh, things will come into picture. If at all you have a long length correct, of the analog correct. devices, correct. I just yes. wonder that why DIBL and punch through will come into picture and why mobility uh -huh. also should be because the voltages are low again. Voltages we cannot go beyond that. So the electric fields are going to be low in the channel as such. And then in that case, my just I was thinking why uh, I mean square law will not be applicable there. But I think uh, uh, the results have shown experimental results have shown that as per yes the yes yes case, uh, yeah yeah so, results have shown that and new models have also been evolved considering okay. all quantum mechanics all quantum okay. mechanical effects and all those. But those models are so complicated for hand calculations. No? Uh, uh, that means yeah, it is yeah. really like green function and all those things. It's really uh, difficult uh, to uh, do hand calculations, I suppose. Uh, and uh, so uh, we uh, require uh, all these tool sets to predict, if I'm not wrong. I think yeah, so. but I, I, what actually you're saying is correct, uh, Rathod sir and Taylor uh, madam also. What actually happens is, as a circuit designer, I don't want to get too much into device physics. Okay. Hmm. Yes. I basically like to look at the device actually at its terminal as a black box. Okay. And, you and then, in terms of IV relationships, hmm. what I require, I want to derive hmm. as a circuit design. Okay. okay. I'll tell. I'll give the sound reason for that. One actually is, uh, I, in my at least in my view, the most important reason actually is, let us say, like you know, whatever actually is Moore's law. Although Moore's law soft working non Moore's. Hmm. Moore's law is now applicable to systems rather than chips. Yes. Correct. Right. Uh, yes. So, yes. Uh, so going by Moore's law. Just with the most law, number of transistors doubles every, like, you know, whatever, 18 months yeah. now, 36 months, whatever. Mm. All right. Mm. So now the question comes, so what? Because that's an empirical law. There's no proofs. Mm. Yes. There's no derivation for most law. So for a fresh engineer, the natural question actually is, all right, Moore's law, I write the Moore's law statement in examination as an answer to a question, right? But then what is it for me? Mm. That information is generally missing for the students. 
Yes. So the answer here actually to that question is that well, let us say I join a circuit design of a, a VLSI company as a design engineer mm -hmm. today. Fine. And today my productivity actually is measured in terms of number of transistors I am able to cook up oh. per day as a designer. Okay. Okay. My circuit design. So in olden days, let us say, like you know, let me take today's example. Let us say today actually I'm able to design circuits of uh, circuits as complex as comprising of 10 transistors per day. Per day in terms of productive work. Mm. <coughs> then I work for two years. Uh, uh. In two years, the number of transistors doubled. Yes. And now actually what happens is there's a demand on my productivity. It has to be yes. doubled. Uh. Because the company is not going to pay me double the salary. Correct. Right? Nor is going to hire one more engineer. Yes. Does that make sense? Yes, yes, sir. Yes. That's the real interpretation of Moore's law. <laughs> there is a gap between the technology at which it is progressing and the productivity of engineers. Yes. And this yes. exactly is where the electronic design automation and all comes into picture. It's the Coming into picture. Mm -hmm. And yes, that, I, that I, is I, where the roles are changing. Yes, yes, yes. So it is no more important for me to really understand the device physics. I need to know one level below the surface. That's all I require as a circuit designer. For me, device is a black box. Okay, okay, I okay. would like to handle that purely in terms of its terminology. Okay. Not the physics. And even if I want to look at the physics, if you look at the circuit uh, simulation models, spice models mm. of mm. devices today, you have mm. not less than 180 parameters. Mm. And 90% of there are 90% or more of those are essentially curve fitting parameters which are mathematical and no relation to physics. Yes. Yes. So it becomes impossible for me as a circuit designer to handle that and come up with something that I can use for Yeah, yeah. I, I I do I do agree, sir. As a circuit builder from the characterization, whatever parameters you get, you can use those maybe for hand calculation or for designing. Yeah. And from device point of view, perhaps physicists can see why these type of characteristics yeah. are there. That is true. I agree. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. So that's what actually is my response. I agree. Okay. All right. So, uh, any other questions, please? Participants, please ask questions. Sir, no questions, I think. All right, sir. Uh, so, uh, uh, does it call for a short break? It's almost uh, done. Yeah, sir. Indrajit sir has asked some question in chat box. In the chat box, is it? Let me get. Uh, I'll I'll read for you if you want. Uh, yeah, go. Are resistors not at all used in analog circuit design? It's not that we don't use it at all. We do use. We have uh, passives available on silicon also. We have resistors. We have capacitors. We have uh, inductors supported on silicon. So we are using any way use. Only if you have very large values of resistances and all, we may not necessarily be better realized in terms of active demand. So, sir, we will have 10 15 minutes break. Yeah, I guess uh, I'm actually okay with five minutes also. And okay. I guess all of us actually are sitting from home, right? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So five, five to uh, maximum ten minutes. Five to ten minutes. We'll be back. Right, so my time yeah. actually is uh, fifty-two past eleven. Oh yeah. Yeah. So I'll come back at. Uh... Well, okay. That's it. Sir, before we break, can I ask one more question to PDK, sir? <laughs> sure, sure. Uh, sir, a differential amplifier, single-ended output, current mirror mm -hmm. load. Mm -hmm. uh, is there a violation of the uh, KCL at the output node? No. Because uh, 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 when even, did... even before, even before, uh, like you know, analyzing it using KCL, uh, I'll just use one simple argument. Uh, <coughs> KCL actually is a derivant of law of conservation of charge. Yes. Which in turn yes. is a derivative of law of conservation of energy. Mm. Mm. So, if in any electrical circuit or any physical system, if I am able to defy law of conservation of energy, 
Mm. Then I can get all Nobel prizes awarded to me. Okay. okay. So not possible. We have not learned it yet. Mm. Mm. So at differential amplifier output also, just to specifically answer your question, man. Mm. Okay, let me go to the so okay. Right? Okay. You can okay. uh, you can see my slide. Yes. Yes. Okay. So now let us say V in is going up towards V. Yes. The so current will increase. Up. Current actually yes. will increase. Yes. M3 right. also. ID2 will decrease. Yes, correct. Okay. Yes. Now ID1 is copied by M3 yes. into the brain of M4. Yes. So at this particular junction, right now yes. I out to zero because this is open circuit. Mm. Therefore, for because I out is a zero, mm. change I in out, ID I four am, uh, uh, must be equal in the magnitude to change in ID two. Okay, we are talking about the change, not the absolute value. No. Okay. It is always the change I'm talking about. Okay. If it's absolute value, it's pretty simple, right? You are just talking about a Poisson condition. No, but since M2 and M4 are in series, the current has to be the same. Sorry? The current, since M2 and M4 are in agreed. series, the current has to be the same. Agreed, agreed. But actually, like, you know, I am actually talking about the change in the current. The directions are different. Okay. okay. Polarities are different, madam. One okay, is the Okay, directions are different. Okay, yeah. That's algebra explanation. Okay, okay. You have to take absolute currents also. Mm -hmm. Okay, did I answer your query? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah, good, madam. Actually, that's what I like most about you. Thank you, thank you, sir. Right from, right from the time I met you at COEPN, I, I would actually appreciate for especially the younger ones amongst the professors of your teaching faculty in the participants and also maybe some students. I don't really know lots of subjects, but I students are in this course. Right. Uh, Chaira Subramanian actually, like you know, I, I always keep telling people he's a role model for young faculty as well as students. Sir, all our faculty members. Good. <laughs> so my statement still holds good, I guess. <laughs> yes. <laughs> still. Uh, Chaira Ma'am is very active. Yeah. Sir, ask the question so that others also will be benefited. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, like, I have seen at Pune. Madam actually Please. working post 8 p.m. sitting tight, untiredly, when youngsters were actually looking out through the window, getting tired. <laughs> so that energy is still there. <laughs> Very good, ma'am. Keep it going. That's what I wish. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Let us make a 10 minutes break. Yeah, yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. One more question okay. in the chat box. Excuse me, sir. Please, please, please. Yeah. Yeah. Up to how much value the resistors are fabricated on chip? I can actually go all the way up to almost 50 kilo ohms. But anything larger, let us look at it this way. No? Like, you know, larger the resistance using passives, right? For a given current, there is a larger power dissipation. And larger the resistance, I experience the same problems on the chip as I experience with either your metal wire wound resistors or even carbon film resistors are used on circuit circuit board on the backboard or the backboard. You take even for a carbon film resistor, let us say 100 kilo ohms, the thermal noise it generates in the circuit is huge. And therefore, I like to avoid going in for such large value resistance. So typically, I would not recommend to go beyond 20 kilo ohms. Anything I require more than 20 kilo ohms, I would actually rather think of putting up different ways of realizing those resistances rather than using passive resistance. In addition, on silicon, uh, typically you find that non silicon polysilicon is perhaps the only layer that really offers high sheet resistances. Higher than uh, those corresponding to uh, maybe like, you know, you're well resistant, right? And they are pretty noisy. They don't use. But I saw actually one more question there in the chat box. One of the professors asking for education purpose, which technology node to use? Uh, to be very honest, technology node doesn't really matter as far as learning is concerned. 
all the fundamentals you need to say. Right, and maybe I'll take the liberty to add a insert a word here. Right, the way I write the word fundamentals. I pick the word, but it's fundamental. So I start by fundamentals right, and if it's fun to work with, else I can go here. That's the problem with fundamentals. So technology doesn't really matter. So at least focus actually on the fundamentals. Yes. More advanced nodes bring in more challenges. That is, if you're looking from the career and placement prospects of your students after graduation from the campus, then as a hiring manager from industry, I would like to hire that student who is good in fundamentals, can do problem solving, right? Can learn on the job, on the ramp, right? And also has proficiency and exposure to the latest in the market so that I can minimize on bench time of the new recruit and make good business as quickly as possible. I hope I answered the question. It is good to give exposure to the latest technology and the engagement place. But focus should be on the fundamentals. I hope I answered the question. Any other questions before we take a break? All right, Rathod, sir. I guess that is, let us get back onto the session at 10 past 12. Yes, sir. Yes, it's okay. Yeah, thank you.
Shall we start, sir? Yes, sir. I'm available. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Sir, these two gray boxes are coming in between, right hand side. I think that's a chat box or something like that. I'm closing it. Ah, okay. So can I get started, sir? Yeah, it's okay now. Fine. Yeah. Right, so welcome back everybody. So we are on to the next session for today, and uh, uh, I'll be mostly working with Sijo on illustration of this particular methodology that is transconductance efficiency methodology of design, uh, which also typically is known as GM over ID uh, design methodology. Right, so the challenges actually we saw as we discussed in the, the last session actually is that. Uh, even starting from 180 nanometers technology node and down for the more advanced nodes, the long channel equations do not hold good as the devices are getting more and more complicated. And therefore, for the circuit designers, and especially for the professors and the students teaching learning and analog circuit design uh, in academic institutions, they turn out to be a big, big uh, uh, pain point. Because what the textbook says, right? may not necessarily work on the tools if you are working at one nanometer technology node. And uh, typically what actually happens also is that you require a set of device parameters and the rule decks, et cetera, for the physical design kit for any technology node to be obtained from a fabrication vendor or a foundry. Uh, but then uh, fabrication is a different business as compared to the EDA tool uh, uh, such as once you get either from Sweden, some mental graphics or uh, some of those. There are two different things. It is like you know, expecting and asking the car vendor to also supply the gasoline, which doesn't really happen. There are two different businesses, but they work together, uh, such as using uh, chip designs. So as a result, what actually happens is for the campuses, the challenge is tying up with a fabrication foundry because any fabrication foundry is looking for silicon business. So although tying up with a fabrication foundry is typically free uh, for academic institutions, the access is given to the PDK. Typically the foundry expects that within one year or two years, you actually give business to them, which normally does not happen. So that being the case, over the time, the fabrication foundries actually have also started changing their terms and conditions. For example, Right, uh, MOSIS, which is MOS Implementation Services, earlier actually used to uh, give for public view a uh, statistical set of test data, wafer test data for various technologies all the way down to almost 130 nanometers free for academic institutions or even individual engineers. One actually could just download those and do at least two simple times. Right, the problem actually is they have stopped doing so for at least last 68 years. So you have to tie up with the foundry, which actually is a commercial activity. So this problem actually is resolved right, by the EDA companies, right, such as Edith Design Systems, right, uh, and others also in the market. Right? They supply a set of what you call GPDKs or APDKs, or maybe some other terminology, right, which actually are generic in nature and non-production version of a tweak set of physical design kit, rule files, and technology models for the devices and the projects. So as a result, 
right? What actually happens now is right, that one actually has to work with these GPKs to start learning things. And I can perhaps illustrate time permitting, right? Uh, where certain things don't really work because the values have been tweaked to ensure that you cannot tape out a commercially working chip using these GPKs. Otherwise, out of somebody else's work, you can actually make a good business for your time. Right? That's what I can be presented. So these GPDKs, at the best, to give you an analogy, work as the small amount of 100 ml gasoline or petrol or diesel the car vendor puts in your car when you purchase a new car just to enable you to drive to the nearest gas station. That's all the purpose of three days. Right? So while there's a great amount of learning that actually one could do using GPDK, you cannot fabricate or design, right? Uh, real world system using GPD. Right? So having said so, right, let us get started. What are we actually going to do now? So, what we do next in this session is I'll talk about the motivation for GM over ID methodology or transconductance efficiency methodology and give a very brief insight and directly get into design illustrations on the tree, right, with the help from uh, CJ. I don't have much to speak. So, quickly, CJ, I guess you're keeping things ready. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, good. All right. So, motivation. As I said, like you know, nowadays we don't actually talk about the uh, devices behavior in terms of mu into C of then W by L, that beta, etc., etc., those kinds of stuff. Lambda is not specified. These are no more available actually as device circuit simulation model parameters in circuit models for devices. So we have a need now to set up a design approach that directly handles or deals with the core design variables such as transconductance, drain bias current, device noise figure, capacitances, etc., etc. So both design variables as well as design parameters of interest, which are directly handled by our design approach. And these must be applicable to all regions of device operation in cutoffs, <coughs> in weak inversion, <coughs> when the device is in saturation, right? In moderate inversion, as well as in strong inversion, as well as in linear region. So irrespective of in which region of its IV plane and at what degree of inversion, right, the device is in, this particular approach must be applicable to all such operations. That's what actually helps us to be able to handle the design, circuit designs, directly in terms of such an approach. And this exactly is where GM over ID becomes applicable to all regions of operation. Let us just look at it. I mean, how do we actually arrive at this? Honestly speaking, this is nothing new. If we actually dig around a little, we actually find that People have used a similar approach even for the older days. There is a paper, I don't have it for immediate reference to list it up here, but you can look up, Google it around, by Paul M. Gray. There's a textbook by Gray and Mayer on analog circuit design, right? So it's one of those authors, Paul M. Gray, paper is there, I took the transactions on GM over IC methodology for bipolar IC designs. So GM over ID methodology is just a version of it which is actually applied to MOSFET. So it's nothing really new. Although you find more recent papers by Jasper et al. right uh, on GM by ID methodology, I took the transactions also. You just Google it and actually find those papers. So what do you find? If you look at expressions for ID either from long channel devices or also accounting for weak inversion operations as well as short channel effects. One thing is plain that the drain current for the MOSFET is dependent on the width of the MOSFET for a given length. Now because the transconductance is change in drain current to change in gate to source voltage and I can actually I can write see different expressions for the transconductance, right? What actually we find is that transconductance in general is also proportional to W, 
right? So as a result, if I take the ratio of GM over ID, what I find is that this particular ratio referred to in literature as the transconductance efficiency. Essentially, physically, it means larger the transconduction for a smaller drain current essentially means that I actually can get larger gains. AV is equal to GM times resistance, right? And also, smaller drain currents essentially means I dissipate lesser power. That's the bottom line. So can I achieve large transconductance efficiency and hence higher gains at lesser powers? At the same time, <coughs> we find that for a given ID chosen as a bias current, larger the value of transconductance, greater is the transit frequency of the MOSFETs for a chosen ID, right? So these are the observations that I think we come up with to around GM over ID methodology by actually characterizing the device. There's nothing really rocket science in this. It's just an approach, a nice smart way of handling design based on statistical traces, lookup traces, or also in terms of values as lookup tables. So it's a combination of statistical approach. <coughs> Essentially what actually we do. And for any hand calculation estimation, we actually make use of generated device data out of characterization. Just to give you a quick insight, if I were to design a discrete PJT or a MOSFET amplifier to work on a printed circuit board or a board, I would actually look up several data sheets of these devices and pick up the one that actually is suitable because these are ready available devices off the shelf are well characterized by measurement on the bench and their characteristics are available as <coughs> data sheets, right? So data sheets give the specifications of the device, right? The specifications actually define the limits of operation. We don't have such a data sheet actually available for devices available on IC because as a designer, I have the liberty to change the biasing, to change W, to change L. Right? There is a lower limit to W and L. There is an upper limit to W and L as a single finger transistor, which we'll uh, get to know more as we get into layouts, right? As a single instance transistor, right? There also is an upper limit to the current uh, uh, values. There is an upper limit to the voltages that actually we can apply as potential difference across any pair of terminals for the device, etc., etc. <coughs> right? However, while we have the device model, circuit simulation models available, we don't have a data sheet available for various devices for different values of gate to source potential, different values of gate to source potential, and for different W by L ratio. We don't have such a data available, unlike in the case of discrete devices. And by characterization, that exactly is what we actually end up doing. We Characterize the devices available in the physical design kit from the foundry vendor, right? And bin them into a discrete set of device sizes and bias conditions. And for that, we run the characterizations by setting up simulations to extract the small signal parameter values for the small signal analog model of the device, which typically are just to list up here. Right. What actually I will do is I will actually end the show and actually I will list up these values up here. So these are GM, then route, then self gain, that is GM R out, then FT, that is the transit frequency of the MOSFET. Right, then the total gate capacitance, the total drain capacitance, the capacitance seen between gate to source under small signal conditions, right, then the capacitance seen between the gate and the drain, all right, fine, right, so these are the parameters of interest 
for the device actually I am using. Now, just to list up the meaning of or importance of these devices. Because gain as well as FT are dependent on GM for a chosen value of ID, right? I have to get information about for given W by L, for given VDS, and for given VGS, what is the transconductance available from a device? So for assorted values of VDS, VGS, W by L, right? I actually have to characterize devices to generate curves of GM as a function of gate to source voltage. Please note that difference between gate to source voltage and threshold potentials, right, uh, is defined actually as the uh, overdrive voltage basically, EOV, which actually defines what is the minimum potential headroom I need to have as between the drain and source of a device to ensure that it does not get out of saturation and into linear region for a given value of gate to source potential. In turn, it also is called overdrive because that also tells me what maximum value VGS can be connected, right, at the gate of that particular device for the allocated minimum VDS potential headroom in order to ensure that device does not enter linear region and get out of saturation region. Right, so that's what I meant here. So transconductance, then R out, then self gain. Self gain, as we actually looked in the first session, right, we talked about the basic gain stage where only the MOSFET, right, turned out to be uh, a real world device. Then actually we had an ideal current source, an ideal supply source, an ideal signal source. So whatever expression we get there for the gain as EV times, or GM times R out, Right, essentially represents the maximum gain that can be obtained from a given device for the given device size and the bias conditions. So, I, if I want to build an amplifier using such a device, then in real world, I cannot achieve that intrinsic gain value at all because in real world, I don't have anything ideal available. So, if I move from there to uh, the practical amplifier, either using a resistive load or an active current source load, such as a CMOS current source load, etc. right? Then for the desired gain, I just need to find out whether my device I am going to use as an amplifying device is going to support that required circuit gain at all or no. Meaning if I want a circuit gain of 10, then the device actually I am using for amplification, right? Must have its intrinsic gain or self gain much, much greater than 10. That's what I mean. Next, I have to also look at FT, the transit frequency, which also is called the unity short circuit current gain for the MOSFET. Uh, please note, the MOSFET actually is a voltage controlled current source device when in saturation, but there are parasitic capacitances at the gate pin. We actually can get to see primarily three capacitances connected to gate pin. I'm not missing all. If I take the cross section of a MOSFET on a silicon wafer, then there are many more capacitances that actually get attached to the gate <coughs> due to the various layers. But three primary capacitances are the one between the gate and the source. So one terminal of this capacitance is on the gate pen. <coughs> Second actually is gate to drain capacitance. So both are actually are listed here as CGS and CGD. CGS and CGD. And there's a third capacitance between the gate and the bulk. Right, so the sum of these three capacitances at the gate measured with respect to bulk is referred to as CGG. Right, whereas CGD typically is made up of your drain to bulk capacitance and the component of gate to drain capacitance at the gate because one terminal of CGD is also connected to drain. So when I keep the gate at reference node ground. Right, then CBB, the drain to bulk capacitance, will appear in parallel with drain to gate capacitance. So CBB actually refers to that particular capacitance. Now, if I look at the MOSFET, right, what I actually end up finding is that the total gate capacitance CGG starts actually offering low reactance at extremely high signal frequencies. So beyond a certain frequency, high frequency value of the signal, right, what I find is that 
there is a non-zero gate current because the capacitances actually are charging and discharging that is cg is charging and discharging right uh, uh, with respect to the signal changing at a high rate and therefore there is a small gate current right and i have the drain current which is proportional to the gate to port voltage so if i take the ratio of ig to ig at high frequency what i get is a current gain i don't talk about current gain for a mosfet at low frequency because at low frequency right all the parasitic device capacitors have sufficient time to charge up or charge down right before the signal changes to the next value and therefore we treat all these capacitances as open circuit at low frequency but certain about certain frequency depending on the values of these capacitances which in turn depend on the bias conditions of the mosfet as well as its channel dimensions what we find is that these capacitances will start responding and influencing the gate current so at low frequencies gate current is zero therefore current density no point in defining it turns out to be infinity but at high frequencies i can define a current gain and as a result what i find is that i can represent the mosfet actually as a non ideal voltage controlled current source no more ignoring the input port current and if i look at any two port network as a black box and i'm interested in what is the voltage gain v out by v in i can simply write this v out by v in ratio as product of i out multiplied by r out where i out is the output port current and r out is the output port resistance i get to see looking back into the output port and similarly v in can be written as i in into r in where i in is the input port current and r in is the input port resistance looking into the input port so plugging this in what i end up finding is that i can write the voltage gain as equal to the product of current gain of the two port network multiplied by the ratio of r out to r in and that's a general expression right so if r out to r in right all the writing it as r out to r in essentially it should be written as z out z in because the load as well as input impedance can be uh, frequency dependent right so it can be z out by z in correctly speaking but however it is r out by r in assuming that the input port impedance and output port impedances are purely resistant right then what i find is that the frequency response of the voltage gain depends on the frequency response of current gain so the frequency at which the current gain falls to unity all right sets the maximum bandwidth i can actually get for the voltage gain also and please note the gain bandwidth products of the voltage gain and current gain for the port networks are not identical except when r out is equal to r in which actually corresponds to maximum power transfer right so it's all network theory nothing else fundamentals all right so it is from this particular perspective we actually try to look at the transit frequency or unity short circuit frequency for the mosfet honestly speaking ft actually really is of not much of an interest all that it actually tells me is loosely if i need my amplifier circuit to give me this much of maximum bandwidth at unity gain <coughs> right will the device i'm using for building this amplifier support that up right so typically for a desired unity gain bandwidth in my circuit i need to use a mosfet device which has a short circuit unity short circuit uh, uh, current gain frequency ft which is much larger than the unity voltage gain frequency i need in my circuit so ft must be very large compared to fvg of my circuit that's what it's doing right so these are the primary things i need to look at so i need to generate curves for each of these things and then in order to keep my computations and hand calculations independent of device dimensions what i also end up actually doing is right exploit this particular observations made here right in addition to the fact that if i take the ratio of id to w even id becomes in this particular parameter right which we call the current density becomes independent of w so what i actually end up doing is start plotting ft versus gm over id 
start plotting current density versus gm over id right and make use of those curves to size up the devices so what i essentially do is do the device characterization to generate all those curves right for different uh, uh, lengths of the device so i obtain plots and or look up traces or tables for gm gm over id ft self gain and these capacitances for different n right then out of these generate derived plots of ft and id versus w versus gm over id and then size the devices based on right the desired regions of operation which i can choose depending on what exactly is the performance i am looking for like say for example right if i have to define a differential amplifier right as i already made an observation and i'm making observation here also right typically you find that <coughs> larger the gm over id ft will be smaller however if you if i fix id then larger gm right means larger ft so it's pretty confusing conflicting so i need to be very careful of what i can interpret it, right also larger the value of gm over id basically means that i am getting large change in id for a small change in vgs at a lower value of gain current so i have a better power performance and i actually also end up getting larger swing because my overdrive voltage is smaller so these are the, the 160 i focus on and then start choosing my device size so to we'll illustrate this hopefully that actually should make sense and please note we are characterizing things for different l we need to observe certain things up here these parameters for the device in saturation are typically weak functions of drain to source potential and for analog design typically we would like to bias circuits for faithful amplification in class a typically using the fundamentals of electronics and therefore we characterize devices to obtain the curves for all these parameters keeping the green to source potential at one half the supply voltage that is given by q right and recognize that while there is a dependency of these parameters on the green to source potential that dependency is reasonably weak as compared to the dependency on g to source potential and that's what actually we exploit and the fact that we are going in for small signal operation again augments my statement up here so you see can characterize and reduce the characterization pain points right by keeping vds equal to v by 2 right at the same time please note that in many circuits there is a non-zero potential difference between the source terminal and the bulk so these statistics also have to be generated not only for different l but also for different values possible values of source to bulk potentials over a range of source to bulk potentials right and if you want to be more exact then i need a huge set of data to look up go statistical any statistical approach requires huge number of sample data and therefore i end up characterizing devices for generating curves for all these parameters also for different potential values probable values of gain to source voltage difference so i have a huge set of data to be very honest right at ntuple we have a tie up with the uh, umc foundry for 180 nanometer uh, technology node where we are developing ips for our own requirement right so to characterize the devices for our designs right at nominal corner right Sijo, can you throw a light how much time we took on a server with uh, how many cores 12 cores cores a 12 core server and we set up the characterization you can actually throw some yeah. light on how much time it took yeah it can take up to one week basically that gives an idea the amount of data we generated and that's only at one corner. That's only at one process corner. And we need to generate this actually at at least three corners. Low corner, nominal corner, fast corner. All we need to generate. So it basically means if I have a very high-end server, then I perhaps actually have to set this up for generation of all these curves and data, right? Uh, 
which may take a couple of weeks of celebration. And if we have committed a mistake, then God help us. So we actually ensure that we do some test runs, ensure that things are in order before we put up the server for simulations. Right? So once we actually have done that, right, then actually we perhaps can actually go in for the results. Right? Does it work in first round? The answer is no. Typically, circuit design, because devices are complex, no matter how much actually we have characterized, there are gaps. <coughs> so if necessary, we may have to iterate the design if the performance is not known. Right? So what actually we now illustrate actually is first of all, characterization of these devices, right, for NMOS and PMOS. And what actually we have done is do it for three chosen values of L. So for that matter, like you know, these are a little bit of what you call short listed values of L to keep the simulations time short for running to illustrate up here and we'll illustrate the setup. We just said starting of the simulations and we'll show the ready results actually available for the want of time. And then use those results to actually come up with the circuit design and simulate. So what we do actually is first characterize the devices, generate all these curves, the simulator is going to quickly illustrate these things, and then we use these curves to basically design a simple common source amplifier with the passive resistive load of 5 kilo ohms, starting from a specification. Sijo, over to you. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So if you have any queries before I go forward, you please feel free to expect in the chat box. Either Rathod sir or Ramin actually will help me to kind of answer those questions. Yes, sir. Yes, you have to take over. Yes, sir. Yes. Uh, uh, if the host, can you make me uh, the presenter so that I can share my screen? Yeah, yeah, just, yeah, just, just.
Hello? Am I audible to others? Yes, sir, you are audible. But uh, Thomas, sir, the screen is not there. Uh, achha, okay. 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 I think he needs to come back. Okay, sir, uh, Shizun is trying, no? I don't have his contact number. Yes, sir, I'm just uh, contacting him. Uh, Navin also is contacting him. Maybe he, that was the problem. Okay, 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 okay. okay.
venugopal sir will you be available in the afternoon session i am very doubtful sir hello acha because then otherwise ah uh, okay okay otherwise uh, uh, because it's or, almost we are nearing 1 o'clock i was mm -hmm. about to tell that since our next session is at 2 o'clock then she took uh, the, yeah then he can thomas can uh, work out on the network and join at 2 o'clock that can be done that can be done not a problem or little little time minister but yeah yeah, yeah. yeah you would just, like to you would like to when he will be demonstrating you would like to talk something uh, in fact like you know, he will be anyway explaining things hello okay so, that's what yeah, he will be explaining yeah, things yeah, he will be explaining things so my availability is little doubtful i'll attempt my best to be available at least for half time I mean until he completes the first uh, illustration acha i'll attempt to be available sir tomorrow will you be there sorry sir okay <laughs> okay okay uh, no no it's okay it's okay uh, then uh, then i think uh, if he is having a problem we can break and if we want we can 10 minutes early little early we can join no that 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 will be fine that will be fine i will tell him that it's okay to we are having joining yes so we can join instead actually at 145 ah that's what that's what i think Okay, sir. I'm okay. I'll just convey that to him. I think so. I think yes, so. sir. Yes, sir. Yes. Ah, I, yes. Yeah, yeah. Then he'll be he'll be settled settled with his network. Yeah, sure, yeah. Sure, sure, sure. So, okay, participants, as discussed with sir. Yeah, yeah. So we'll join at one forty-five, please, sir. Huh? All of yes, you. Sir. Otherwise, yes, we'll sir. have to wait again for fifteen twenty minutes. Please, please join everyone. Yes, sir. Please. Yes. Sir. So, participants, now please join at one forty-five.